Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 464, Democrats are having the wrong healthcare debate. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moppin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moppin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone? the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of tea replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. Democrats are having the wrong healthcare debate. That is a title of an article that was written by Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, who's a provost uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and a physician of some repute. Uh, he's a noted author and public speaker on healthcare concerns and issues. And after watching the two presidential debates uh, within the Democratic Party that have been had in the last two months, Dr. Emanuel said all of these candidates are talking about Medicare for all, some form of Medicare for all, and then they're debating all the different intricacies of how to moderate and modify Medicare so that it'll appeal to voters. And he says that the Democratic candidates are taking the wrong approach, that they're looking at the wrong end of the telescope, and we don't have to get into a conversation about Medicare for all at this point uh, in order to make substantial economic improvements in the way that the medical system in the United States works. And he has come up with four suggestions, Mm -hmm. four areas of concern. He said, if we just modify these things in these ways, the existing system will adjust at a substantially lessened cost. So the problem, Mm -hmm. he he says, and the problem that really is, is that we don't have health care for everyone. No matter what we got with uh, President Obama, it didn't really give us health care for everyone. It did help us with pre-existing conditions. However, we, we just, we need a lot more than what they offered at that time. Mm-hmm. Now, giving us Medicare is not going to be any different, except Medicare actually uses insurance companies. We don't get away from insurance companies. It uses insurance companies to actually function. There's a lot that politicians have no idea about the medical system. They're not doctors. They don't own, they don't own a medical business. They don't understand how the intricacies of actually of actually trying to run a business practice and trying to survive in the medical environment. We have unfunded mandates. They come up with these things that you're supposed to do, and it costs thousands and thousands of dollars to the doctor practice, but it doesn't bring us anything else. An unfunded mandate is the government saying, you have to do this, but Mm -hmm. we're not going to pay you anything for doing it. Right. We're just going to make you do it. And it's going to be a law. And so they do that all the time. Once a year, we get something. So we have to scramble and do it. We had to all be on computers. We had to, we have to, um, let's see, they, oh, HIPAA compliance yeah. and, and uh, OSHA compliance and all of the different compliances that a medical of- office requires. Every year there's something new for us that we have to do to actually function. So they don't get that part and they don't help us with that part. They just give us more of those rules. And they also don't understand that to just send in, I, like I don't take insurance anymore because I just couldn't take it anymore, but but to just send in bills to your insurance company, it requires a huge staff of people, in addition to my nurses, in addition to my medical ass, uh, assistants, in addition to my office manager and my operations manager, it takes a whole team of people to just sit there on the phone on hold with your insurance company to just get paid for anything. So. It's 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 a wasted amount of time and money but on behalf not of a the doctor. Government process. That's an insurance company process. Right. That is. So so there, there are two different elements but there, but both Medicare. of them add to the cost. If, Medicare if your doctor is, part is a of Medicare that. doctor, yes. If your doctor is a Medicare doctor, you have to you still have to have an Do office full of people to just get claims through, and then they. It's really silly to have that much overhead to just provide medical services. Yeah. Well, so they they don't really state the problem correctly, and they simplify the answer because they don't understand how it really works. And I'm not sure 
most of those guys are real problem solvers. They hire problem solvers. And and that's okay if they do that. But if they think they're problem solvers, the only problem they, they seem don't know to the problem. be able or willing to solve is the problem of getting reelected. Right. That's it. That's the one but thing. But that's not a most of them are really problem good at. like what we're all used no, to in real no. life. Or, or there, there's substantial data that says 80, 90 percent of the population wants this change made. Mm-hmm. And they never quite managed to get it done. No. I'm, Obama did. He did. I mean, with the passage of, of the Obamacare ADA, mm-hmm. uh, it was done. And he but went around was, Congress. In and order to get it done, they had to <clears throat> create situations that could then be manipulated later, mm-hmm. like states that could increase or decrease their mm-hmm. welfare rolls, and the federal government was going to pay for the increase for 10 years and then be back on the states, uh, mm-hmm. or, or the issue of uh, required funding. You had to pay it or you had to pay a fine mm-hmm. uh, so that everybody had to get into it. It, the, it was done, and it did get increased insurance coverage for about 20 million people, mm-hmm. but it, it wasn't best done. But 80% of the population in the U.S. have insurance. Some kind of insurance. Some kind of insurance. So, but that isn't always the solution either, Kathy. No, I know. I mean, we were talking just before we started. <clears throat> I had read an article about a woman with cancer who had good insurance and a good doctor, and they discovered stage 3 cancer. In her, and the doctor said, "You need this particular medicine." And her insurance company said, "Well, okay, we have that in our formulary." But the pharmacy benefits manager that her insurance company had a contract with said, "We don't ever jump to stage three cancer medicines. You have to go through stage one and stage two, and you have to do that and, and try them for so many days before we can say, well, that doesn't work for you.'" And and allow you to have this stage three drug, which mm-hmm. her doctor said she already needs medically. Right. And I mean, they're. So this is my biggest problem yeah. with insurance companies, just by the way. They practice medicine without a license. They're telling a doctor what to do. They don't have a license in medicine, and what the person you're talking to probably isn't even a medical person. Right. They're just trying to save money. So by saving money, this woman's going to lose her life. And that is And she is has a, no recourse. That's There's a nobody crime. she can sue. I mean, eventually maybe her family can sue the pharmacy but benefits she'll be manager. But and that's wrong. Absolutely wrong. Wrong. I could not so agree if with they you want more. to control, it's enraging. if they, yeah, if they want to, if the government really wants to control cost, they should put all kinds of rules and laws on the insurance companies and on the pharmaceutical companies so they don't rip off everyone in America. That's what we're being ripped off by insurance companies. We absolutely are, and pharmaceutical manufacturing companies, because just like the EpiPen. Somebody mm-hmm. can say, because I want to, I'm going to raise the price of $1,000. Right. And, and, and then no one can afford it. We've already it. passed a law that says every school in America has to have EpiPens. Well, that's the in beginning. a certain number. <laughs> and then as soon as they got that law passed and the guy said, I've got a controlled market, a captive mm-hmm. market, now I'm going to raise the price and all these people have to pay me, whatever I'm asking. And they did. And they did. Uh-huh. And that's... And there's only one person that makes the EpiPen. And that's so the it's a monopoly. free, unregistered, They've broken, regulated capitalist market. They've broken market. monopolies before. They yeah. broke the phone company. They broke a lot of other monopolies yeah. the government did. They haven't yet but done But they this. aren't going to break the monopolies of insurance companies and pharmaceutical well, companies. Well, let's look at some of the because that's the first point of the mm-hmm. four points that Dr. Yeah. Emanuel is talking about. One of them is to tackle drug prices. And he said that the United States has just over 4% of the world's population. Mm-hmm. And yet it spends nearly half of the global spending on drugs. So the (laughs) average per person expense for drugs in the United States in a year is $1,443. Prescription drugs. Prescription drugs per person in the United States. So then he compares that to... So we're talking babies, we're talking children, we're talking everybody. everybody. Yeah. The average per person Mm -hmm. expense is almost $1,500 a year. And that's not because of the number of drugs. That's for any drugs. It's because it's so expensive per drug. And some are more expensive than others. Yeah. So he said Switzerland, which he compares it to, is the second highest per capita spending for drugs uh, Mm -hmm. in in the world. They spend $940 a year per person Mm -hmm. on average. So uh, what, $500, $600 difference Mm -hmm. uh, between what we spend in the United States and and what they spend. Mm -hmm. And he said the difference... In cost is that the Swiss government negotiates drug prices with the pharmacies, right. pharma, ph- pharmaceutical mm-hmm. companies, right. the manufacturing companies that make drugs. 
And so he is suggesting that our government should do that, not just Absolutely. for Medicaid, but for all drugs. For everything. And that, that they can regulate the, the cost of the drugs through those negotiations, mm-hmm. and the drug companies will, will cut the price. Well, they've done that with doctors. With doctors, we have a book that says this much of, if you do a procedure, this much of the procedure is overhead. This much of procedure is what the doctor does. Uh-huh. This is the risk. This is, I mean, they give you this, this book of how they value a procedure, they should do it with the drugs. How much did it cost to bring to market? How much, you know, how much does it cost to manufacture? And then determine what that price should be. They do it, they do it for medical fees. Medicare is a fixed fee for doctors. They should do it for, for the medication. Well, and so Dr. Emanuel says that if we paid the same amount that the Swiss pay, just just as a mm-hmm. given, that we would save $160 billion a year <laughs> that's amazing. in our economy that's right now being spent to buy expensive drugs. How many people could we feed? I mean, that's... Or other things could we do? Feed, Roads could we build? Flint, yeah. Michigan could have water pipes that don't spread, <laughs> right, I mean, have lead in them. Services for if our... If we chose to spend it there. For our actual tax-paying, pay, or even non-tax-paying, but for our population. Right. That's amazing. So that would, uh, he said, and if, if that's too big a bite, if we just took half of that, I mean, we could still save 10% of the cost of what we're spending annually on drugs and have that money then available to spend somewhere else. Right. And that's, and we, um, I have a, a friend who is also a patient who had a drug prescribed for him that was $6,000 for one month to prepare him for a surgery. And he might have had to be on it for two months just in, if surgery was delayed. Right. So $6,000. A month times two, twelve thousand dollars is probably more than. That's that's what he makes in half a year. So mm-hmm. that's huge for that person, for any person, for any person. That's insane. Yep. And the drug is really an old-fashioned drug. It's been around forever. It hasn't. It's not like it's rocket science. It's just that not many people need this drug. Well, so so one of the issues in the United States, I, mean, I saw a, st- a study the other day that said the average American citizen has less than $400 for emergencies in their bank account. Right. And so if you have to come up with something that costs more than $400, like a new set of tires, uh, then you have to borrow it Mm -hmm. because you don't have it. But if you get hit with a medical bill that's Mm $6,000 and you don't have but $400. For one bottle of 30 pills. Yeah. So people (laughs) either die or go bankrupt. Because they mm-hmm. can't get the medicine. That doesn't help our economy when people go bankrupt. Right. It doesn't. And and so somebody needs to do something. And Zeke Emanuel is saying if the Democrats will focus on these four points, they can, if they can get it through Congress and get the president to sign it, they can substantially reduce the cost of drugs in the United States. One through uh, or what, the whole medical system for drugs in terms of negotiating the prices of drugs. Mm-hmm. The other thing, they, there are two other things they could do to decrease costs of drugs. Okay. One is they can accept that compounding pharmacies aren't going away because compounding pharmacies um, step into the breach when the government says, oh, we're, we're going to take the company that makes all the lidocaine and take it off the market and retool it because of some, something they're trying to do. And who, who makes that for all the people that need lidocaine? To, to numb you up for surgery, to numb you up for procedures. Well, the compounding pharmacies do that, and they should get off their case because that's increasing the cost of compounding drugs because these pharmacies are having to go in and negotiate, not negotiate, they're, they're actually going into lobby just like everybody else mm. to try to stay alive. So that's one thing. They actually provide a service. The second thing is... All the stuff that the FDA does to, to bring a drug to market is just BS, and it costs too much to bring real drugs to market. So we should do what Europe does. We bring it to market with some research, some some uh, ability to see if there's a problem with it. But even then, they have lists, you know, a mile long of what the problem is with these, and they still bring them to market. So why not do that ahead of time? Yeah, or potential and bring, side effects. bring them yeah. for, for people who need them. I mean, the potential side effects are something you're going to find out when people use them. But seriously, more drugs would get to the market at a cheaper price so they, they couldn't justify how much money they, right. they cost. Right. So, so you're talking about the balance between regulation 
mm-hmm. and the cost of regulation mm-hmm. versus the cost of not regulation. Right. And, and so there are multiple costs. One mm-hmm. is a dollar cost. Mm-hmm. One is a potential health risk cost. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when you see ads on television for drugs, they always very quickly recite a whole litany of things that are known side effects of the drug. So you mm-hmm. could have this problem, this problem, this problem. And then they say, be sure and ask your doctor about this uh, mm-hmm. before they give you the drug. Yeah, but but everybody's going to take it if they have to take it because those it, those aren't aren't things that happen to everybody. They they happen to somebody. Yeah. Now it'd be nice yeah. if we knew. Well, who if, it was the, if the doctor to. were able to say, uh, there's an eighty percent chance if you take this medicine, you'll get over this thing, you'll survive. Mm-hmm. But if you take this medicine, there's a 20% chance that you'll have problems with your knees. Right. Or, so, so I want to die or do I want to have knee problems potentially? Mm-hmm. I mean, those are, if it gets reduced to that, then people can make a decision because they have mm-hmm. information. But the way it's done right now, the federal government will say there's a, for instance, a friend of mine was taking a blood pressure medicine that the manufacturer said, okay, there's a risk of cancer if you take this. It's maybe, like 0.006% maybe. risk. Yeah. So they pulled all the drug off the market, and everybody that was on that drug then had to find a different drug that didn't have that ingredient in it until the pharmaceutical companies were able to figure out, is there really a risk of cancer mm-hmm. or not? But the government said, pull it. But it had still gone through three levels of research and three right. very expensive to on the trials in the first place. to even get on the mar- on the, on the, in the market and to be given to patients. So. Why do we need all that if we're still yeah. going to pull it off the market? Viox was the same. We used Viox. It's an anti-inflammatory that helps pain without being a narcotic and without making you weird or tired or sleepy. So we gave it to a lot of people with endometriosis, and it just stopped their pain. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, we didn't have any problems. All of a sudden, they took it off the market because people who were old who took it had some heart issues. Yeah. So... We couldn't use it for our patients who were having endometriosis before the age of 50. Who weren't old and didn't who have heart old. issues. And, I mean, that that seemed like excessive. But what it did do was it, there was a remaining drug that was also a COX-2 inhibitor. That's what they call them. And that one didn't get pulled, and it skyrocketed in price, and it skyrocketed in, in its uh, stock. So that one drug is out there to to take – so basically it gave it the whole market for – um, endometriosis, but it's a thousand dollars for three months, yeah, and nobody can pay that. So that that's the problem. But the stockholders for that particular country company, got lucky. Company, yeah. yeah. But or they or the FDA guys had. I mean, we haven't checked them out to see what stock they buy. Oh, your turn. <laughs> okay. So very quickly, we want to run through these other points. Dr. Emanuel has suggested four things that we can look at and save substantially in each area. The second thing that he mentioned was hospital pricing. He said that Medicare and Medicaid set their own prices to the hospital. If you take Medicare to Medicaid patients, this is what we'll pay you for each of these procedures. And you can argue all day whether that's a, a realistic value or a good decision. But he said the problem that's gotten to be is that people that have private insurance, not Medicare or Medicaid, that the hospitals have increased the fee over what they charge for Medicare mm-hmm. uh, in, in, uh, recently. Uh, Rand study indicates that on a hospital, averages now charge private insurance companies 141% more than they charge Medicare for the same procedure. And he said something has to be done to balance out the legitimate cost of the procedure, factoring in a, a profit margin, factoring in all the various expenses that are involved, but it's not being done. The, the government regulates it in terms of what they'll pay for a Medicare procedure or Medicaid procedure, but not in terms of what private insurance coverage exists. Well, Medicare, how they decide you're going to pay this for a certain um, a certain procedure is uh-huh. or a certain hospitalization is that they basically take all the money that they have and they say, well, how many procedures of this a year do we expect? And they kind of divide it by how much money they have. So if they undercut the hospitals... They depend on the insurance companies right. to be paying more. Yeah, the whole system would have to shift the way right. they, they so do it. Right. So they're sh- cost shifting. Yeah. They know they're cost shifting. Even if they're paying less than it costs the hospital, they know the hospital will charge everybody else more because they don't have enough money for so all this. So because of the way the worms are mixed together in mm-hmm. the pile, if you try to shift that stuff out, you, mm-hmm. you are talking about cost shifting. But people that don't have any insurance – go to the hospital, the hospital has to treat them. 
They have to take them at least mm-hmm. in an emergency, life-threatening situation. Then they can peel them off and send them other places. Mm-hmm. But they have to take them. Mm-hmm. The person who has Medicaid, they go to the hospital. The hospital treats them and can only bill so much. Mm-hmm. The person that has insurance, the person goes and the hospital bills Whatever. exponentially mm-hmm. higher. And then you get into the lawyers and the arguments and the discounts and the other factors. Right. So if it's you're, really hard to figure out if, what anybody charges for anything. Right. What anything's worth. Right. So well, basically, too- yeah, basically if you have no insurance and you have a huge hospital bill, you can go to the um, accounting department and cut a deal. Say, I'm going to pay this much a month. Like I had patients that had no insurance and had babies. And so the, when they found right. out, where we were going to deliver, and and they cut a deal basically with me and said, we're going to pay this much a month, and we'll be paid off by the time we have the baby. And they did that with the hospital as well. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up being okay in their budget to have the baby, basically, and be paid for and not go to a clinic. So that's how they did it. But other people can go to the accounting department and cut a deal and say, I'm going to pay this much every month. Now, God forbid you don't put your payment in that month, then they're going to, then it all the, the discount goes away. Yeah. It's a challenging system that needs to be organized. And, and so that brings us to the third point mm-hmm. that he makes, which is if we have standardized medical billing, they use a single form. Everybody <laughs> uses the same form. Amazing. And because there are so many different forms that the, the administrative cost that's spent on a dollar of care or $10 of care is, mm-hmm. is $9. Mm-hmm. And if you standardize the billing systems and everybody has like one, uh, one place to send the bill, and it gets, I mean, it's not government mm-hmm. paid, but it gets sent to one place where it's administered. A clearinghouse. Clearinghouse. Mm-hmm. Then you reduce the cost exponentially. That would, be, that would be amazing. And they do have one form for our, like our office has something called a HICFA form yeah. where everything is coded and put in. And then since we don't take insurance, we fill it out for the patient and give it to them. They can send it to their insurance, right. same form as everybody else's. The insurance will pay them whatever they'll pay them. And if everybody went to that standard for all of the things that mm-hmm. they use, or if that, that form could mm-hmm. be stretched to cover all those things, what Zeke Emanuel is saying is that would reduce some of the cost, a substantial amount of, mm-hmm. of cost and service. He said in excess of $30 billion. Another uh, $30 billion dollars we could feed people, house people. And and then the last thing that he I must su- be a Democrat because I don't, I'm not filed that way, but that's what I want to do with that money is make people healthier and make people... Have, Spend it more efficiently have food and, and more successfully. And, and not be on the street. Yeah. So go ahead. Well, the last thing he says is that we need to switch transition medicine over a three- to five-year period to a more value-added pricing system mm-hmm. and create incentives that are not currently in the market for physicians and nurses to do a better job than they do of taking care mm-hmm. of people by removing a lot of the restrictions that are there that mm-hmm. handicap what they can do. Mm-hmm. like. Uh, and, yeah. and that that would reduce the cost. Mm-hmm. So, th- so there are four things that he's suggesting. You can read his editorial. It's in the New York Times, and it was published on August the second. It's titled "Democrats Are Having the Wrong Healthcare Debate." We're all having healthcare debates, whether we're in politics or not, because we're trying to figure out how to survive the healthcare system so that we can survive. So, we would encourage you to get involved and contact your politicians and say, This is what I think. This is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I need. So, please become an informed participant. Thank you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance Healthcast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.